So let's start with the pyrimidine synthesis, uh, which is simpler. Um, that's the pyrimidine ring. And these three carbons and nitrogen is straight and aspartate molecule. Okay, so aspartate amino acid, we have already discussed. Uh, it's, it's an input for pyrimidine synthesis. Aspartate, we've also seen it in the, in the urea cycle and so on and so forth. So it's a precursor for, for uh, quite a few things. Uh, this nitrogen and carbon, in, in, uh, on the other hand, come from carbamoyl phosphate, which come from uh, simple compounds such as CO2 or bicar bicarbonate in, in the aqua solution and ammonia, right? Plus the two ATPs that you have to spend to generate carbamoyl phosphate. We have seen the reaction before in the urea cycle, how you make carbamoyl phosphate. And those two combine in a series of four or five reactions to eventually give you uh, UTP along, of course, with the activated ribose, which as we have said before, we've seen it in the amino acid biosynthesis, in, in, in tryptophan and histidine biosynthesis. The form of ribose that get incorporated is the activated form of PR, in the, in the, it's PRPP, so the, the diphosphate, the pyrophosphate, so the two phosphates on the, at the one position of pentose. And from then on, you make UTP, um, then CTP, and as they are, you know, with the two hydroxyl group uh, present, those go straight to RNA, but you need to reduce the two hydroxyl group uh, in order to make TMP and TCTP. TMP needs a little further, needs an, another methylation also to, to go from UTP. Okay. But we'll see all this in, in a little more detail. So first, how you get to UMP? You have ammonia and CO2 and, and um, uh, you get to, in, onto carbamoyl phosphate. Uh, in, in, you still need ammonia, but the source of ammonia now, instead of being something else, it could come the ammonia from glutamine too. And again, that glutamine serves as an amino donor, as, as a nitrogen donor in this case. Um, there is an enzyme that uh, takes the amino group, generates ammonia, and then it is used to make carbamoyl phosphate, phosphate okay, along with CO2, obviously, with carbonate. Um, once you make once you make carbamoyl phosphate, then you bring in the aspartate and you make this compound carbamoyl aspartate, which is ready to be cyclized into this form, the hydroxyorotate, which then, after a few little steps, there's a redox reaction here and then an incorporation of PRPP, and then finally a decarboxylation to get rid of the carboxyl group of aspartate to give you UMP. Now back to the first reaction, carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. We had seen this, as I said, in the urea cycle right there. Okay, we had discussed the, the mechanism uh, at the time, so we're not gonna do this again. But remember, this was happening in the mitochondria. Uh, the one we're talking about, it's the same reaction, but it happens in the cytoplasm. There's just a different version of the enzyme in the cytoplasm. It, it essentially does the same thing. Okay. So you generate your carbamoyl phosphate in the cytoplasm, in this case. Where is the ammonia coming from? Uh, one major reason, ma major source of ammonia in the cytoplasm is actually glutamine itself, as I said. So um, there is the, um, you generate this, uh, this uh, tetrahedral intermediate and, and you remove on the enzyme, there's an amido transferase. And so now this ammonia can leave, this amino group on glutamine can leave, generate ammonia and uh, the intermediate, the, the thioester intermediate here eventually will be converted to glutamate. So you go from glutamine to glutamate, you release the ammonia, and now the ammonia can be picked up and be incorporated into carbamoyl phosphate. Um, once you have carbamoyl phosphate, shown here in green, the aspartate will attack it. The amino group is a straightforward nucleophilic attack, and you will make uradiosuccinate. And then, once you make a uradiosuccinate um, or carbamoyl and aspartate, um, you can close it and make dihydroorotate. And I'm showing you this uh, mechanism that was discovered in 2012. Um, basically, you have to set up uh, the, to help out the attack, the amino group on this molecule, on the carbamoyl and aspartate. To, to attack the carbon the, on, the, on the carboxyl group here and close the ring. And the enzyme helps, obviously, in, in this reaction, as you see here. And the scheme was discovered by um, Frank Roussel, uh, who is a professor in biochemistry and biophysics and also in chemistry here at AM. So 
It's an Aggie, there is some Aggie pride here, and that's the reason why I'm showing you the slide. Now, the next enzyme, what it has to do is to oxidize this uh, cyclical molecule, okay? Um, so it will abstract electrons, right? So, so it will take the electrons at, from this, uh, at this position and make a double bond. That, that, that is its job. Um, and the interesting part here is um, what's going to happen to those electrons. Hmm. So it turns out that the enzyme uh, sits in the inner mitochondrial, inner mitochondrial membrane facing out, however. So dihydro rotate can come in from the outside. Um, it is acted upon by the enzyme, generates a rotate. Now the electrons that it removes from dihydro rotate can be used essentially to, they are fed into the electron transport chain and then can be, they can be passed on to Q, okay, and reduce Q. And that's exactly what uh, we, we have seen before. So this is actually uh, a, an input into the electron transport chain. And it is an essential step for pyrimidine biosynthesis. So if you block this enzyme, as I said, then you may be able to, um, to block um, uh, the synthesis of pyrimidines. Therefore, you can block the ability of cells to make this building block for the building blocks for the nucleic acids. So you block them uh, from proliferating. And sure enough, um, these compounds will do it. Okay and they will block this uh, enzyme, the, the, the hydro-rotate dehydrogenase, and they are chemotherapeutics. And at the same time, usually the same compounds and vice versa are also immunosuppressants. Uh, what is an immunosuppressant? Uh, immunosuppressant, you take it, uh, for example, when you want to uh, reduce the ability of your immune system to mount a response. Uh, when will that be beneficial? Well, clearly not when we have a COVID-19 uh, infection going on, but uh, when you have an organ transplant and you don't want it to be rejected by your immune system, this is when people, patients usually take a lot of immunosuppressants for a long time, long term. Um, why is that? Because the immune system, the immune cells are uh, some of the most proliferating cells in, in our bodies. And that's a problem for chemotherapy. Okay, you, you will kill uh, normal cell proliferation such as uh, immune cells or other cells like hair follicles and so on and so forth that need to proliferate. Um, but in this case, uh, this is beneficial at, at the appropriate dose. Anyway, the point being that inhibitors of this enzyme, which is important in pyrimidine biosynthesis, um, can be used as chemotherapeutic. The last point I want to make is that, uh, um, um, again, the, the ribose to be incorporated into, into this uh, uh, nucleotides, you ha it has to be activated. And the activation is always the same. It, it always has to be in the PRPT form. So you have the pyrophosphate at the one position. Okay. And that's, of course, the other input, uh, major input from the pentose phosphate pathway that generates you know, ribose units uh, so they can be incorporated into nucleotides. Lastly, to make UMP, you have to decarboxylate. Um, and the mechanism is shown here, okay? And it's a very straightforward mechanism. I mean, you, you have to, you, and as with any decarboxylation, you generate a carbonion, um, and the carbonion can be uh, um, um, uh, used to, uh, to pick up a proton from an amino group of the enzyme and get UMP. Now, the interesting part about this enzyme, OMP decarboxylase, is that it's an extremely, it's a turbocharged enzyme. It's extremely efficient. It increases the rate by an astronomical rate. All right, so you got UMP. How do you get to UTP? There is this enzyme that uh, has broad specificity for all nucleotides and mononucleotides. It's gonna, it's gonna take them and, and, and phosphorylate them. So instead of one phosphate, it, it will give you the full uh, complement of three high energy or of three phosphates. So it's, you're gonna get all the way to the gamma phosphate, uh, whether it's U, you know, A, G, or whatever. It works on all of them. And you've got UTP, and UTP can be incorporated now into RNA. Uh, to make uh, CTP, okay, the difference, now CTP is necessary, uh, it, it's, it's used, of course, uh, um, uh, you, you need Cs in, in DNA, okay. Um, and the difference is that uh, this keto, um, 
in both RNA and DNA. So the, the difference is that is that this carbonyl group is aminated. So how do you get to, from the U to, to the C? You have this enzyme CDP synthetase. Again, the point is that what's the source of the amino group? It's glutamine again. Okay, so you see how important glutamine is as an amino donor. Okay. Very, uh, another illustration. We've seen many, but uh, it keeps coming up. All right, so you got your U's and your C's. Now you're pretty much uh, ready to make RNA. Okay, no problem. Uh, and CTP is also used for DNA, provided that uh, it's in the deoxyform that uh, we'll see in a minute how that happens. Okay, here we're going to take a little uh, tour of how, I mean, I keep telling you that this important, these things are very important for proliferating cells that need to make their DNA. How does that look like? Is, is that really true? I mean, how, do we have any evidence for this that you can visualize and, and see as they replicate their DNA? So I'll show you some uh, results from, uh, from our own lab that we published a few years ago. So the enzyme coding for CTP synthetase, the Euro 7 or 8 in yeast, they come in two varieties. And the question is what happens when you, you mutate them? You knock them out and what happens? Well, you can follow the amount of replicated DNA in the cell in a very simple way, uh, which is essential to code the DNA with a fluorescent dye. And if a cell has not replicated its DNA, it will fluoresce, let's say, 1x. But if it has fully replicated its DNA, it has gone through the DNA synthesis phase of the cell cycle, it will fluoresce twice as much, right? I mean, you make, you, it has twice as much DNA, so it, will fluoresce to, it should fluoresce twice as much. Anything in between the amount of fluorescence per cell um, is indicative of a cell that's in the process of replicating its DNA. So it, it has a little more than, n, than 1x, but a little less than 2x somewhere in between. All right, how does that look like? Well, you can take, you know, say, thousands and thousands of cells, shoot them through a machine that has a laser that detects fluorescence per cell, and then plot the results as a histogram, okay? So uh, this is one of these boxes that, that you see here. So what you have on the x-axis is fluorescence per cell. And as I said, this is a histogram of thousands and thousands of cells. And, um, on the y-axis, see how many cells uh, fluoresce this month. So it's, it is a history. <sighs> Excuse me. All right, so this is a normal, uh, happily proliferating cell, and you have um, a proliferating culture, and you have cells that um, fluoresce this much. You know, that's the peak, a nice, beautiful single peak on the, on the left. And that's, let's say, let's call it 1x. And to the right of it, you have another peak, of all the cells in the culture that uh, have uh, twice the DNA content, so they fluoresce twice as much, so the fluorescence per cell is twice here compared to this peak. And these are the cells that have completed their DNA replication. And maybe in here you see some that are in between, okay, so they're in the process of DNA replication. So the question now is, what happens if you don't have this enzyme? And you can do this, okay. Um, well, yeast has two, as I said, so you can knock out one and still be alive, but uh, you may have problems. So this is what happens when you take out one of these CTP synthetases in, in, uh, in yeast, so they cannot make the full amount of CTP needs for DNA replication. And you can see now that this culture, okay, um, it's still alive because it's got a URA8, okay, so you can make some CTP, but instead of showing these two beautiful, well-separated peaks of unreplicated and fully replicated DNA. Uh, now you have cells that uh, have unreplicated DNA, that's the first peak here, but then right next to it um, is something that flore a, a peak that indicates all the cells that fluoresce um, less than 2x, but more than 1x. So these are in the process of DNA replication. So this is a delay in DNA replication. This is how it looks like uh, in real life. You have an accumulation of cells in the process of DNA replication, so you get very few cells that have a fully replicated DNA, right? So yes, if you inhibit these enzymes, okay, I wasn't telling you lies, if you inhibit these enzymes by drugs, or in this case, by genetic means, by removing them from the cell, you impair DNA replication. All right, um, how do you get to, these are the ribonucleotides, okay, U and C. If you want to make C to, um, um, uh, 
so you can put into DNA, okay, you have to, to reduce the two hydroxyl group. So you have to make DCTP. Uh, likewise, for if you have GTP, which we have a zinc or, a, or ADP, how do you put them in the DNA? This two hydroxyl has to be uh, reduced. And this enzyme, there is a specific enzyme, a reductase, that goes in and reduces this two hydroxyl. It works on the diphosphate versions of the nucleotides. Okay? And it gives you all the stuff uh, you need. Let's say, uh, which is the re reduced uh, nucleotide. Now, then it has to be phosphorylated fully. Uh, to the triphosphate form to, to get you to TP, to DCTP here, or DGTP or DATP. Um, so the theme here is that you make, excuse me, that you make ribonucleotides first before you can make deoxyribo. It is evidence, uh, or people think of it as an evidence of, a, uh, of an RNA prebiotic work. And we have seen bits and pieces of that uh, evidence earlier too, you know, let's say NAD, many of these fundamental uh, metabolites, they look like metabolites, uh, they, they look like building blocks of RNA. Again, suggesting very strongly that there was a prebiotic RNA world, um, indicating that the, the DNA world, the, you know, the deoxynucleotides are an add-on to an RNA world. All right. Um, the enzyme works uh, like this. It takes a ribonucleotide and converts it to a, to a deoxynucleotide. Uh, and, um, and then it can be phosphorylated further to the triphosphate. So this, it works on the diphosphates. Uh, it's a redox reaction. And so anything that, uh, so it, other redox uh, pathways, including glutathione that we have discussed earlier as, a, as a, an antioxidant, is very important here to maintain the proper redox uh, homeostasis on the enzyme, okay, for the enzyme to work. Um, it's important to know that unlike some of the uh, salvage pathways we're going to discuss in a few slides, where you can get bits and pieces that you can make uh, ribonucleotides, there are no salvage pathways that can take you straight to, to deoxyribonucleotides. So the only way to make your building blocks of uh, DNA is to use um, uh, this enzyme, RNR, so you depend 100% on it and if you, for generating your uh, DNA precursors, uh, or DNA building blocks, uh, which explains why RNR is, is essential in all, in all systems, in all, uh, all cells. How do you make the T from you? That's another pyrimidine, right? The T is found in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in DNA, whereas the U is only found on RNA. But you make the T from U, okay? Which is again, another evidence that you have something RNA came first and then the DNA part came second, um, came after that. So the difference between U and T is one methyl group. The source of the methyl group is folate, the tetrahydrofolate. So the reaction will look like this. And you have the, your UMP, you convert to the TMP that you can put in your DNA, you need timidly synthase, which is, all it does is to stick a methyl group right there, okay, right there on UMP to give you the TMP. Um, the source of uh, carbon for this comes from folate, and that carbon can, comes from serine, okay. So remember, from, uh, as we discussed a slide or two ago, or, uh, a lecture or two, or two ago uh, previously, um, you have glycolysis somewhere here, makes uh, from 3-phosphoglycerate, you get serine in two or three reactions, and serine has three carbons, and through the action of serine hydroxymethyltransferase, okay, um, the one carbon will leave and be attached to tetrahydrofolate here to give you methylene tetrahydrofolate. Remember, folate is a, is a, is a, um, a key cofactor in one carbon uh, transactions. Uh, what's left of serine becomes glycine. Okay, three carbons of serine become the two carbons of glycine, and the one carbon from serine now is found itself on, the, on, on, on folate, and then it will be given to, to UMP by thymidylate synthase to generate um, uh, TMP. All right, and then the whole cycle con con continues. Uh, we have uh, the hydro, we have this form of folate, and then the hydrofolate reductase will come in and regenerate tetrahydrofolate which can then pick up another carbon from serine and keep doing this. 
So regenerating this proper folate form is also an important component of this um, uh, reaction, which is important for making building blocks of DNA. So interference at any one of these steps will inhibit um, um, TNP synthesis and DNA replication. In fact, many drugs, as you will see, used to this day in chemotherapy, um, also attack uh, DHFR. Oh, the enzyme uh, timidylate synthase is essential for life. Uh, if you knock it out, uh, let's say in yeast, uh, that's a lethal. Okay, CDC21, that's the name of it. 